All right, hello and welcome to the Nature Journal Show. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to nature journal your food. Some food might be less interesting to nature journal than others, but it all is nature and connected to you, which is a really cool thing. So we're gonna start with some warm ups, and we're going to dive into some sort of unorthodox ways to nature journal your food. So be prepared for that. I hope you have either an item with you or I'll share the items that I'm looking at on my document camera and you can nature journal those. Make sure that you have your nature journal ready and um, turned to a fresh page. I have my title on here and some of the strategies that I'm going to be talking about. I'm also using a different mic today because my fancy mic has not been working. It's been like disconnecting during the live shows. So hopefully the sound is um, still okay. And I'm gonna dive right in with the document camera here. Hi, Cindy, hi, Jean, hi, Anetta and family. Um, lots of people joining in on the chat already, which is awesome. Glad people have already been eating some good um, food, it looks like today, and even cooking over the fire, which is awesome. So obviously, like I mentioned before, some food items um, might not immediately come to mind as something that'd be interesting to Nature Journal, but you could probably come up with a cool experiment that you could do even with pasta and get that in your Nature Journal or at the very least sketch note the recipe. Um, other things might be even less interesting such as, you know, like sugar or something um, that is really boring, but we're gonna start off actually with a drawing warm up. And I think that lots of food items can be perfect for a drawing warm up. And that is exactly where we are going to start. So I'm going to put out a couple objects here. So you might want to do this on your regular page, or um, you could have a separate page for doing your warm up. Some people feel more free when they're doing it on a separate page. I'm going to just do it right here in my main nature journal. Let me get this pasta out of the way. Oh, awesome, Ray Bonto is here. I'm gonna lift my desk up so it's closer to the camera. Pardon the noise. Lots of salad so far, which is awesome because we're actually gonna nature journal some salad and talk about techniques for nature journaling salad today. So I'm glad that two people have already mentioned salad on their menu. Um, from earlier today. So what we're gonna do right now is we're gonna do a warm up and I'm going to try to get the light a little bit more dramatic on these items right here. And this will be a classic sort of um, drawing exercise that you've probably seen, you know, people have been doing these since like the time of Leonardo da Vinci. So I'm gonna turn off this light um, and get these shadows a little bit more exaggerated here. The reflection on the table is a little bit tough, but let me put something underneath that real quick. Here we go. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do some warm up sketches of these food items, which are basic shapes. So go ahead and just on your paper here at the top of your page, or if you want to do this on a separate page, you can do that as well. Do um, a warm up sketch of these shapes and practicing getting three dimensional shapes. So I'm actually going to use my food a demo in. Where is it? So go ahead and get started. We're only going to do this for a few minutes. So you might as well um, get nice and warmed up. And this is the kind of thing you can do multiples of. So don't just stop once you have three drawings. I would say keep going. You can draw the shadows if you want. You can practice getting a value range if you want. Remember, getting three dimensional, the illusion of three dimensions and getting a value range, those are some of the main um, artistic goals. Also, you might notice that I've included the cut onion and the cut onion shows um, a really good example of an ellipse. So when you take a circle and put it in perspective, that creates an ellipse. So for example, with this wonderful tea mug I have here, um, it's a perfect circle if it's pointed at the camera straight on. As soon as it turns like this, it becomes an ellipse. So that circular shape is really challenging to draw and really common in nature. So right here on this onion, it's formed an ellipse and I'm gonna move it now. So if you're drawing it, start a new drawing. 
now it's more at, at, at an angle still and forces you to try to visualize that ellipse shape and draw it accurately. So we're just warming up now, so don't worry about each individual drawings. Don't use your eraser. If you're using your eraser, um, stop and just start a new drawing instead of using your eraser. And let's just get warmed up a little bit here. Sometimes this is also a good strategy for breaking in a blank page. That blank page can be intimidating. Don't worry about the drawing that I am doing. Um, I'm trying to make it so that you can see a little bit but most importantly, focus on what you're doing. If you're getting the values, um, you might be noticing the shadow, the cast shadow could be the darkest place in your drawing. What is the lightest place? And do you have a way with the tool that you're using to indicate that? What kind of a value range can you get? You've probably seen before where I make a little value range spectrum. I think we did this last week and we practiced creating a um, spectrum going from zero which is completely white paper to whatever nine or ten which is completely black and then practicing um, shading on a spectrum between completely white and completely black so try seeing if you can get that value range as you draw these um, quickly all right, I think that's probably a good enough warm up for me. Um, food items from your refrigerator or lying around your house um, are good warm up items. So at the very least, you know, maybe you couldn't nature journal um, one day, you didn't have enough time, but you could at least put out a couple lemons and do, you know, five minutes even of sketching of them. The next obvious nature journaling technique that we can do um, is I notice I wonder it reminds me of. So we can do I notice I wonder it reminds me of on food items quite easily. And it can make food items that you think are boring much more interesting. So let's start off, for example, with this onion. We can do I notice I wonder it reminds me of, and that can include a drawing. Let me get rid of the lemons. Well, actually, I'll leave those there in case anyone's still sort of doing a warm up. And let's do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of on this onion. I'm going to bring it closer to the camera so that we can zoom in. If you're getting started already, I would say just dive right in and start writing down things that you notice about the onion. Remember that there's a difference between things that you notice and things that you know. So you don't notice that it's an onion. That would be something that you're bringing in from outside information. What you could notice is the shapes, the colors. Um, if you were in, in the same room as it, you might notice the smell, or if you could touch it, the texture. Maybe you can notice the sounds that it makes. You can notice there's different colors in different places. You can notice patterns such as um, concentric circles. Those are all things that you notice. So to demonstrate how to do that on paper, you can do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of completely verbally, but I'm gonna do it on paper. And um, the abbreviation is in a weir mo. In a weir mo. And then what I like to do is just make it into a list. So I'll write, I notice, colon, and then I'll just put a bunch of things like concentric circles. papery outside. Now that's using an uh, analogy or metaphor, so that could also be, it reminds me of, I could just say different colors. And I'll say um, hemisphere because it's like half of a sphere. So those are some things that I notice, and you can do your, I notice could also be, um, let me get closer to the camera still, your I notice can also be drawings. So when you're doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of, um, on your food or anything else in nature, it can be drawings as well as um, words. Pardon the noise here as I raise my table. I've been trying to adjust things lately because I have this knee injury and it makes certain things that I normally do at my workstation harder to do. 
Let's try this now. Okay. So what else do you notice about this onion? I noticed green parts in the middle. Notice that I didn't say I noticed green sprouts in the middle. That's not something that I know for sure. That's something that I is it would be an interpretation. So I'll just stick with um, I notice green things in the middle. If you never know, if, if you're ever confused with what type of nature journaling to do, just do, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. This is the more that I've taught nature journaling and the more types of advanced nature journaling that I've experimented with, the more that I've realized that I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of is like the most powerful nature journaling technique ever. So um, it never gets old. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of never gets old. You can always learn more from I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. So now we're going to go into I wonder. I wonder, oh, um, I like to practice using incomplete sentences here so that it's faster. So instead of writing out I wonder each time, what, I'll, what I try to do is come up with even one word questions. If possible, um, I'm going to ask uh, what is... The papery part. Sometimes your first question can lead into your next question. So maybe what I meant to ask is where does it come from? Where does the papery part come from? Um, is that part edible? And then can I make paper from it? Now, some of you might have seen my um, recent multimedia experiments, my multimedia nature journaling. So what my mind immediately goes to, can I use this in like scrapbooking? Like, can I modge podge this um, onion skin? So these are sort of silly questions. And if you notice silly questions coming up in your mind, definitely include those, um, write those down because silly questions can lead to some of the best discoveries in human history. So um, don't hold them inside or think that they're, they're dumb. Okay, um, another question might be, let's go for sort of a different category. You've probably seen my video, Taxonomy of Questions, where I talk about all these different categories of questions. But one would be relationships. So these are sort of relationship questions. Um, can I mod podge it? Can I make paper from it? Is that part edible? Um, maybe I could ask about its relationships, such as, um, let's see, a relationship would be, does anything eat it? Does anything else eat it? Um, does it have symbiotic relationships with anything? Um, anything about can I use it for this or how is it related to me or is its environment impacted by me or how many places have humans brought onions to around the world? Those would all be relationship questions. Can I use it for medicine? Those would be relationship questions. Okay, now last but not least, it reminds me of, whoops. It reminds me of, and the it reminds me of is your chance to bring in all the outside information and interpretation and the things that you already know about the object. And there are more exotic food items coming soon. This is just the warm up. It reminds me of, this is where you bring in the boring information that might, is probably true, but might not be true. An onion that was cut, cut and left on the counter. You can also bring funny, it reminds me of. 
Um, such oh, or how about it reminds me of tree rings. Tree rings uh, reminds me of ripples. Fingerprints. Sometimes I skip it reminds me of, but this is a good thing for your brain. And if you're if you're leading a group of sort of novice nature journalers, the it reminds me of is the opportunity for the for you to allow the know-it-all to expound upon their memorized facts. But remember, the I noticed part, the observations um, are not memorized facts. So if someone starts naming the botanical parts of this. Um, or the Latin name, that is not I notice. Um, that is, is an interpretation or memorized facts, but you can let that part come in during the it reminds me of. So I'm gonna do a quick sketch to go with this, but I'm gonna keep it um, really quick and I'm gonna draw it from my perspective. So it might look different than the perspective of it that you're looking at. And while I'm doing this sketch, go ahead and type in your favorite question. Sometimes it's good to go back in here and make stars next to your favorite questions um, and then you can also take these and um, bring them out here and ask more questions relating to them so go ahead and type your favorite questions into the chat and i'm going to do a quick sketch of the onion the paper part is kind of hard to draw can't wait to hear what kind of questions people came up with i notice i wonder it reminds me of is best done in a group that's where it really shines as an exercise, and you can learn a lot of things from every single person in your group. Um, and this is one of the things that is revolutionary about nature journaling is that every single person can make novel, valuable observations and ask novel, valuable questions in nature, um, regardless of their skill level or expertise in the subject. And sometimes not knowing anything about a subject allows you to notice things and ask questions that the experts won't. So doing, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of in a group is super powerful and make sure that everyone's voice is heard because some of those people are gonna have questions, um, even though they might be a little kid or someone who doesn't seem to know anything about a particular subject, those people can have very valuable observations and questions, so make sure they get a chance to speak. I said I was going to do this really quickly, but I'm just going to throw some watercolor on it um, real quick. I'm going to go in here with my, starting with my quinacridone gold probably, um, and just maybe do it in a single wash here. Now I'm going to take a little bit of the Italian, um, actually it's Monte Amiata Natural Sienna, and I'm going to drop that in while it's still wet a little bit here. Maybe it's not the perfect color match. Maybe I need a little more red, but I'm gonna to try to do this all in one. So now I'm gonna take buff titanium, which is sort of an opaque. Ooh, great question from Charlotte, a process question. One of my favorites to ask, how did the layers form? Great question, Charlotte. Okay, now while it's still a little bit wet, this is probably dangerous, but while it's still a little bit wet, I'm going to drop in the green. And I left a little bit of clear area around it so it didn't get too wet on wet. All right, so we're done with the onion. Yes, the onion's not the most exciting food item to Nature Journal, but everybody has one. Um, so it is a good option to try. Same with lemons. Lemons are pretty common, but we're going to dive into some more stuff right now. So, so far we did... Um, a warm up, we did. I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do a collection. So, those of you who ate salad today, I'm going to lower the table again so we have a bigger picture. Those of you who ate salad today, you could do this type of nature journaling with your salad, especially, especially specifically if it's a mixed salad. There's probably other things you could do, um, other types of food you could do a collection with, but a collection. If you haven't seen my video where I talk about it, John Your Loss has a great video where he talks about it. Um, if you've never heard of it, a collection is a really common nature journaling technique, and I'm gonna start mine over here on this page. Um, it's a really common nature journaling technique. You might have done it already without knowing, having even heard about it, um, but it's really cool, really common, and really fun. 
and basically you choose a category. So you could even just nature journal all the stuff in your refrigerator. I think I did that. I have done that before. And I sort of just had, um, you know, a bunch of squares and, um, then I drew all the different things in my refrigerator in those squares. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do a collection of salad mix. So I've got some salad here and I'm going to look through it because there's different kinds of plant material in there. Um, I I've never done this with salad before. I've done it in meadows with wildflowers, with animals in tide pools, things like that. But right now I'm going to do it with lettuce. Ooh, great question from Cindy. What conditions keep this thing existing? Very interesting. Okay, now, um, let's see. Let me get my salad ready over here. Um, wait, don't need that yet. Not for the salad part. Um, where's the salad at? So this salad that I got comes in this kind of a container. And maybe you've seen my video already, but you can multi-purpose this container and not waste all of the plastic. So I did a video where I talked about how to um, create a viewfinder for uh, painting landscapes. And what you can do is you can um, cut out a rectangular shape here, whatever size you want, and use that as your viewfinder um, for drawing landscape ethos. That's so funny, the, the light doesn't, it doesn't show up in the light very well, but you can see that um, shape that I just drew there. And I'm just going to use these scissors. If you're, if you're a kid, ask parents for help with this part. Oh, okay. So, and you should do this once the thing is almost empty because otherwise you're gonna have a huge hole in the side of your thing. So the cool thing is a lot of times people um, for viewfinders classically would use an opaque material such as cardstock or paper. But the cool thing about a, a, a clear one, a transparent uh, viewfinder is it can be smaller and you can see through it. So you could even draw composition lines on it, for example. All right, so now I have a cool hole in the side of my salad mix so that I can access the salad uh, access my salad very easily. But in addition to that, I also have this nifty viewfinder. And you've probably seen how I use these before in the field, but I'll just switch to my other camera just to show you. So when you are drawing a landscape, one of the really hard things about drawing landscapes, especially landscape vetoes in your nature journal, is that the way your eyes work is you see nature all the way out to these sides and even beyond 180 degrees, but you can't fit that onto your piece of paper. So um, you can use this viewfinder and you hold it out like this and you only draw what you see inside of it. So for example, if I wanted to draw my color wheel back there, I could fit my color wheel, a little bit of the blue color from the bathroom and not much else. Or if I want to draw my hand right here, I would try to fit that in there with a little bit of my wrist or something like that and that would be my composition. You can also draw lines on here, showing um, like where thirds are, and that can be really useful. This is basically an indestructible little viewfinder that can fit, and I usually keep mine um, in the back pocket of my nature journal kit next to my watercolor palette, and then when I draw a landscape, I'll pull this out, hold it out over the landscape, and I'll sketch what I see inside of there, and then do my painting. And you can watch my video um, how to use a viewfinder for painting landscapes. I think that's what it's called. Um, it's really easy. So that's one thing you can do um, while you're getting ready to nature journal your salad. Okay, so the next step for nature journaling your salad is to take them out. Charlotte, the uh, nature, the viewfinder is really, really useful for landscape painting. Um, the second time I went to Tanzania on the Nature Journal Safari with John Muir Laws, a bunch of other people, um, the having one of these viewfinders, I don't think I had the plastic one at that time. I had one made out of cardstock, 
but it made my um, landscape paintings come out so much better. Um, and it's really been a useful training tool. Even once you use it for a while, you might get to the point where you don't always need it, but you've learned um, a lot from having used it. I'll show you some examples from my, um, from my other pages, um, or you could watch that video. If you just look how to nature journal with a viewfinder, it'll probably come up. All right, so collection is really easy. Um, the first, I'll just start over here at the top left. Um, one thing you can do, you might want to use pencil or non-photo non blue pencil, um, but just constant battle trying to find the right balance here with the white paper um, reflects so much light. Um, one thing you might want to do here is create a sort of grid, um, maybe with your non-photo blue pencil um, or with graphite. And um, I think I'm just going to be play it on the risky side and just start with my gray pen and create a, um, a grid here. Whenever you set up something like this on your page, it is limiting because you don't know like if I were nature journaling outdoors and I start doing this and then suddenly a cheetah comes by, I would have to change my whole page layout and that could be um, that could be hard. But um, for this, I think it's going to be fine. I need to try to make it so that the, the leaves are lit up more, but my paper is not so lit up. Let's see here. Filming, um, filming a... Uh, you know, your paper, white paper can be a major challenge, especially when you have something else that's um, a lot darker next to it. Awesome. Tim Brown had a bry. I'm not even sure how to pronounce that. I think that means barbecue or something. Tim, it, Tim was one of the ones who also decoded the, uh, the post that I made with the photo of Rambutan and still haven't given away why that was related to today's show, but will soon. Okay, so I'm gonna just start in the top left here doing my collection. Um, oh, I should probably use some written words of um, salad mix. Remember, you can always jump ahead of me if you need to, um, and um, or you know catch up and skip parts. You can add things that I'm not doing, especially since I'm talking a lot. I can be going slower than you. So at the, at the most basic, a collection would just be me drawing all of the different types that I see. So I might start separating them out, actually. Um, there's this one with the red. You could also look up more information about them. I know some information about them, so I'm just going to start putting in those things that I know. So this is different from I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. I'm just going to use outside information and not be... Um, you know, questioning it. So this is, I'm sure this, I, I know what genus this is, if not the species. Um, I think it is beta vulgaris, um, which is the same species of beet and of chard. Beta vulgaris. Um, you can write whatever you want, but combining words and images is always good. I'm going to put a little arrow pointing at the stem and say red. Um, so you can see there, that's that one. If you want, you can put numbers next to a collection, but it's not necessary. All right, so I'm also noticing next that there is one that looks very similar, but with a white stem. Oh, you know what? This might be spinach, though. Oh, no, this one right here is chard. That's definitely chard also, so another beta vulgaris. So I'm going to draw that one next. I'm noticing that it's bigger than the other one. But I, I'm limited by how big of a leaf I can fit on this um, square. If you want to, you could um, look up more information about these online, for example, or in a seed catalog, 
or if you have these growing and you harvested from your garden or got them at the farmer's market, you could put information about that next to them. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit more when we do the next um, nature journaling strategy, which is called uh, species profile. And that's when you focus on just one. If you're not sure about something, you can always put question marks next to it. So I'm going to put on this one, I'm going to put um, a question mark. I'm pretty sure this is the same species as the last one. It's just a different variety. Um, I'm going to put white in apostrophes because it's not exactly white. But there you can see, um, there you can see the second one. Oh, nice. Tim had um, barbecue, what we call barbecue in the States. That'd be really interesting to look up the etymology of those words. So that would be a cool thing to do while nature journaling food is to look at etymology of these words. And I have an, an awesome etymology dictionary, but it's easy to look up etymology online. And etymology is not the study of insects. It is a study of word origins um, and can be really fun. And would be I'm going to put that as a note over here on my page, actually. Um, food etymology. There's also endless things you could do around food and maps, like where different types of food come from originally and how they moved around the world and became parts of different cultures, cuisines. Um, so I'm going to do this leaf next. I think this is in the same family as those, but it might be a, a different species. I think this is, um, is spinach, um, which is in the same family as chard and beets. Whoops, I started with the gray side of my pen. Ooh, maybe I should have started with the lettuce relatives because I think they're going to wrinkle more quickly. Whoa, I kind of, this one's confusing with the three dimensionality and the veins. I think I made it, I probably should have simplified it more and not drawn that overlapping part. Um, can't remember the Latin name of spinach right now, but I'm just gonna write spinach so I don't need to put it in italics anymore. But I will put a question mark. Um, these would all be really awesome to look at under a microscope as well. This family in particular would have some interesting, um, like texture or crystals or little cells um, that make them recognizable. All right, now I'm going to dive into these. This one's looking a little bit sad. Um, maybe these are some of these shapes are going to be a little bit tricky to draw. Oh, wow, that's a sort of torn stem. Um, okay, I don't want my collection to be too biased by like what's fresh and what's less fresh, but I'm going to start with, I'm going to do this one next. Ooh, Suzanne's having turkey and charred soup. Maybe this was a bad idea for an episode because I'm just going to get all hungry listening to what everybody else has been eating. Okay, so I'm going to draw, draw that leaf next in my collection. You could do a collection of soup also. Uh, most soup has um, multiple ingredients in it. Okay, now I'm coming into the part of the page that is a little bit overexposed, but you should be able to see this ink. You have to be careful with some of these leaves that have the um, crazy sort of serrated patterns because you can get lost and lose the overall shape of the leaf. That's why it could be good to maybe start with the non-photo blue pencil or something to get the outline shape and the proportions because once you start following the outside contour and the serrations and all of that, you can lose the um, proportions. And the proportions are often more important than the details. But our tendency is to want to draw details and we get lost in the details sometimes. Um, so I, th I, I, I'm just going to put what family this is. It's probably in the, uh, I mean, it's definitely in the Asteraceae, so the sunflower family. And it's probably Lactuca, which is the lettuce genus. Um, but I'm just going to start with the most general thing. So I'll write Asteraceae. This is why it's good to know plant families. 
Asteracea is a huge family, and then I'll write Lactuca question mark. Speaking of etymology, Lactuca and lettuce, both of those words come from the same root as le or leche, like and latte, which means milk in Latin because um, lettuce produces milk, especially if it's this one might not, does not hasn't been connected to a plant for a long time. But when you break the stem on a fresh piece of lettuce, especially an older one, it produces a white milk. Lactuca, Lactuca sativa would be um, the full species name. Okay, now this looks like a lettuce as well. Let's see if I can get this to stay open. This is where the color would be, paint, painting with color would be useful, even though this would be a challenging color to get. So it doesn't want to stay open. I could describe it with words um, as well. Remember, words have different powers than images do. So your drawings have certain powers, your words have certain powers, and your numbers have certain powers. So why would you use a sword when you need to fight with someone that's really far away in an ancient battle? You wouldn't. So why would you use words when a drawing will work better? Or why would you use a drawing when words would work better? It's sort of the same thing. Choose the right weapon, choose the right tool, for the situation. Um, okay, so now I'm going to, um, yes, lactose, another good example, that's a great example, Raybonto. And that one has the CT kind of sequence in the same order like in Latin. Um, and the OS ending is added to sugars. I, I think um, sugars always get that O-S-E um, ending. So I'm gonna probably ruin this one because I already started uh, with the outline mostly. I probably should have simplified it more, but whatever, I'll just have fun with it instead. And then I'm gonna write Asteraceae, Lactuca, question mark. So question marks are amazing. You can just put them after anything and it's better to be curious than to be wrong. So with nature journaling, we tend to be on the curious side. And when we're curious, instead of being convinced, then we're wrong less often. And once you're wrong and convinced, it's way harder to work your way back. But if you're curious and unsure, you can always change your mind when you get new information. So starting off curious um, first um, and putting question marks on things when you're not not sure is always the best. Now let me see if I can find some. There's another Asteraceae that should be in here, um, but it might be in small. Here's one, but I need to get a better piece than that. I think, oh, here we go. This is something different. I'm going to get this one. I think it's probably just um, still Lactuca sativa. Um, ooh, that's going to be kind of hard to draw. That one will be a little tricky to draw, but let's do our best. Ooh, I should write brown on this one. I'm gonna use my words instead of um, drawing it because look how fast I could just write brown. That's way faster than mixing up my watercolor for that. Okay, time for a tea break. It's still pretty early where I live, so it's okay to drink tea. I'm not gonna, I know some people can drink tea at any time of day um, and still sleep well, but. Um, you could probably nature journal that too. So you could nature, I don't want to be biased and just focus on food when you could be nature journaling beverages as well. Um, I'm sure it would be really cool, for example, to do some type of map talking about like where tea comes from. And this is one of the ways where nature journaling connects us to nature and our food is, is, is some way, is a way that we connect to nature every single day and, and we impact nature in a huge way through our food choices that we make every day and same with our beverages. So like doing a map and figuring out, you know, where my tea is coming from could be very interesting. I wonder what the ecosystem looks like where that tea was grown. I wonder how much biodiversity there is where that tea was grown. I wonder if my choice of tea has any impact on the local biodiversity. I wonder what impacts it might have on the people that live there. I wonder what kinds of conditions those people pick the tea in. I wonder how that tea um, is in relationship to the rest of my body when I consume it. I wonder if some types of tea are grown in different ways. 
I wonder if T is, um, has a different effect on the biodiversity than other crops that might be grown in that region. Or what about the sugar that I put in my tea? Where is that grown? How much of the planet is dedicated to growing sugar? What types of ecosystems is sugar grown in? Where did it grow first? So you can see that food definitely can be, um, you know, a source for, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Oh, Tim, well, I'm glad you made it in today. And uh, don't drink any caffeine. I mean, I know I, I couldn't if it was, uh, um, if it was midnight here, but I'm glad you can make it in today um, and, and part participate a little bit. And I must say, I was really, really proud, um, really, really proud to see that the audience of the Nature Journal show, yourself included, two people in my audience, I d correctly identified that Rambutan fruit. So that was really cool. And the reason why I posted the Rambutan was because, not because I'm going to Nature Journal Rambutan today, even though I want to in the future, but I have another strange fruit um, or you know strange for some people fruit that I was going to nature journal and so that is why I posted that rambutan photo which I took a, a long time ago. Oh Eva is here. Hi Eva. I'm going to show this um, question from Cindy which is a is a good one as well. Um, you can see um, from her question that there is some sort of outside information or knowledge that she has probably heard or looked into. And I think um, that might be one of the, I've never heard of bird friendly tea. Um, it's possible. Maybe it just hasn't been marketed yet, but I have definitely heard of um, bird friendly coffee. Um, and that would be really cool to nature journal in a coffee plantation, especially if it were a bird friendly one. Um, and then Arpon definitely, I mean, Ray Bonto definitely nailed the uh, identification there. Um, and I think Ivea will like this one because Ivea has been teaching a class on um, plants and plant families in our food. So that will be cool. Yeah, no worries, Tim. As soon as you need to go, go sleep, um, take care of yourself. Okay, so there's probably one more, at least one more thing in here in this collection, the salad collection that I can find. And I think I'm going to have to look back in the salad box um, to see if I can find the um, find a, a more entire piece because I think this the leaves of this might be oh no I just spilled the whole box on my on my floor all right so this might be why your mom told you not to play with your food some of this is also wet and it's getting my paper wet this is probably also why I shouldn't have cut that big hole in the side of my uh, side of my um, salad box. Maybe I could just spread uh, salad dressing all over the floor and just eat my salad from there. Ooh, Susan B knows what plant family dragon fruit is in. One of my favorite plant families. Okay, so this one's going to be interesting, and this is already like a good reason for doing this, is that, look, this is not an entire leaf. So far we've been, everything in the collection has been entire leaves, but this is not. I wonder why. I wonder why this is, or it looks to me like it's been cut. Um, I don't see the full outline. Like this is obviously a whole leaf, right? Or it seems like a whole leaf. So how will I draw that? Well, it's already kind of going to be more annoying to draw because it's not a whole leaf. Um, the color would be the giveaway um, for making my drawing look like it. So what I might have to do is use my words more and use my outside information more and just know. So this is a good example of when your subject might be the reason why your drawing doesn't look good. So your drawing might not look good because it's a challenging subject. Now look at this. This is a super easy subject. You know, it's very easy to create a drawing of that that would look um, realistic or convincing. So if you try to draw this or that and it looks weird, um, it's because of the subject. It's not because of you. So that is a perfect time to use words. It's the same like if you're trying to draw a bird that's in a really pos weird position or like try drawing my hand right now. I dare you to try drawing my hand right now in this position and see how 
how that comes out, okay? Even a photograph of my hand in this position is gonna look really weird and not convincing. This position, however, uh, you know, a three-year-old could draw a hand in this position and everybody would know um, what it is. So it's not about you, it's about the, the subject matter. Same with this, so I'm gonna use words instead, and I'm pretty sure this is uh, radicchio, so it's probably, uh, what is that? Um, I'm blanking, it's like one of my favorite. It's the um, same, same genus as like ondyes and oh it's chicorium so i'm pretty sure it's chicorium genus i might be getting the spelling wrong but i'll put a question mark and because i'm not totally sure and it's also asteraceae i have more space here so i'm gonna say i'm gonna put in some questions because i'm interested about this one and my collection's almost full so i'm gonna put in strong red color dark red why not whole leaves? And um, I'm also noticing that the leaves seem to be like wrapped within each other. Like this leaf, I think it's two leaves, but they're all intertwined and connected, more like cabbage. So I'm gonna actually just say cabbage-like. And um, it's also thicker, um, denser than any of my other ones. Uh, it's not cabbage. It does look quite a bit like red cabbage, but it's radicchio. So radicchio is um, a, chicor a type of chicory, like endives. And um, radicchio and endives are also asteraceae, but they're in a different tribe or sub tribe than lettuce um, and it's one of the few in this species that has um, it survived because it has this pretty color it's usually really bitter but these ones have survived because these big salad mix companies use them um, so I'm going to do one other crazy thing really quick with the salad before moving on to the dragon fruit um, and hopefully we'll get to the one animal food item that I want to nature journal today. But first I want to try something really crazy. And I don't know if this has ever been done in the history of, uh, actually I'm sure it's been done in history, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, try to press some of my salad mix in my plant press. Um, I've been sort of addicted to pressing flowers and plants lately, and I think it'd be really funny to press some food items. Like, I wonder if you could even do like a really thin slice of onion and then um, put that into a plant press. And this is how they used to do, and still to this day, do a lot of botanical specimen collecting. And I'm trying to come up with ways to hybridize this technique um, with nature journaling. Like, how can we combine pressed flowers and pressed plants into our nature journals in sort of like an herbarium type way. Obviously there's certain benefits, like you could get something way more quickly through pressing it than through trying to draw it. That's one benefit. And then the other benefit, and most of us aren't going to be doing any um, DNA analysis when we get back to the studio, but if we were, um, or if someone else were to in the future and we had some pressed plants in our nature journal, then those um, could be useful for DNA. The other thing too is this is one of the few, this is one of the few ways where you can get smell into your nature journal is through pressed plants. So what I want to experiment with right now is pressing some of the salad. Um, and I'm sure there's probably some people in some part of the world who um, are going to be very, very not excited about this or think this is the dumbest idea ever. Um, people who maybe who've pressed a lot of fancy flowers before, but I am going to press some of my salad mix in here and see what happens. Um, I'll probably choose the ones that are a little bit less moist and I'll make sure I'll put my cardboard pieces to make sure there's good airflow so that it doesn't mold. Um, and then I could always add these to my collection later and these could be more accurate than my drawing, for example. 
Now remember, if you're doing this somewhere where there are plants that could be rare or endangered, um, follow all local regulations and your own sense of ethic around what you can or can't harvest. Um, you know, the laws, the, the actual written laws aren't necessarily the most important thing all the time, but definitely develop your own personal ethic and ability to make ethical decisions um, yourself based on your value system and your ability to look around you and decide. Um, but I'm sure this salad is not endangered. Um, so putting some of it, actually it's endangered because I'm probably going to eat it. So I'm going to just do this, put my next page on top here. Oh, maybe I'll, I'll write a little note, um, and date to, what is today? The 27th to 27, whoops, 27, 22, um, salad, <laughs> salad mix. And then I'm going to make sure that I have these cardboard pieces have, as you can see, you can see light coming through here. There's um, these hollow bits that go all the way through. So that allows for air to move through. So I'm going to make sure there's a cardboard piece on both sides um, of the pieces of paper that I used for this one, just to make sure it has the maximum airflow possible. And I'm going to try to disturb my other specimens as little as possible. I'm planning on doing a whole video about how to combine, actually I'm filming it already, a whole video about how to combine flower pressing with nature journaling. Oh man, I've been missing all of this amazing, um, all of this amazing conversation in the, um, wow, amazing conversation in the ch live chat. If you're not checking out the live chat on YouTube, um, you're missing out. Um, I'm missing out because I'm trying to do all these things and the conversation is fast paced in there right now. Um, oh, I was going to try the onion too, but I think I'll just skip to this and um, let's see here. Yeah, so I have a video I'm going to make. Um, and I'm working on it right now about pressing flowers and how to combine that with nature journaling. I can hear the leaves getting squished in there right now. Okay, so those pieces of salad are getting pressed. So we did a collection. The next thing would be a species profile. So we're gonna do species profile with this um, specific type of dragon fruit. And just to start it off, I'm gonna do these are the ones I'm going to do. So I, I talked about several strategies that you can do to nature journaling your food. We did, I noticed, I wonder, it reminds me of, we did collection and now we're going to do species profile. I'm also going to do dissection. Dissection is a really important nature journaling technique. Um, and it's something that some of the original nature journalers like Leonardo da Vinci used a lot and, and people don't use as much today, but it's really good with food. This is already a dissection, but we're going to get into it more with this. Um, and first though, I am going to talk about how to do a species profile of something like this at home, where you could um, do some information about contextual information about where you bought it. But if it's coming from really far away, you might have to um, venture onto the internet and, um, find out some contextual information that way. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to share my screen. Um, and let's see here. Um, I'm going to share my screen and just do a little bit of research um, on this dragon fruit to include. Ah, my browser is supposedly blocking this. That is annoying. Um, click the screen bar. Shoot. I don't know what's happening. Um, there we go. Okay. Sorry about that. Just some technical difficulties here. All right. So you could go on, um, you know, when, when I was like in high school or whatever, Wikipedia was uh, 
not a uh, considered a good source of information, but I actually use it quite a bit for like if I'm nature journaling at home, like at the very least, look at how great this is for scientific classification. You can go over here and you can see it's in the cactus family. It's in the Cactoidea subfamily and it's Selenocereus genus and species Selenocereus megalanthus, which is really cool. You can also look at synonyms. I used to think it was Sirius also. Um, and then you could at the very least maybe get some images of what the plant looks like, which I'm not seeing here right now. Sometimes you can get like a map. Um, let's look at the external links. So there's external links down here. That could be good. Um, some of these could be images. Let's look at the iNaturalist one. Oh no, it's just sending me to iNaturalist page. Anyways, you can do some background information um, on your plant, maybe get a, a flower a, an image of the flower from here to do the species profile. At the very least, I'm going to quickly copy the um, the Latin name, and I'm going to do my fancy uh, brush pin here. So italics, um, Selenicerius, and you should usually space this out before you start with ink, but I'm not going to. Selenicerius. I already know that the species is not going to fit on here, so I'm going to write it down here. Uh, lowercase for the species name, remember? Still italics. Megalanthus. Okay, so at the very least, you could get the species name from um, Wikipedia. Day, month, year is uh, way better. Um, I must say, I mean, just, it makes way more sense to go from specific to general. So I'm just saying that because there's a whole conversation going on about, um, what the, the dates are and significance of dates. Okay. So now it's time to bust out the dissection tools. Um, or you, we could draw it before we dissect it, but okay, I'm going to stop the screen share not as interesting as, um, and my computer's struggling with it a little bit. Okay, so uh, we could do a quick sketch of the outside. I think I will. It's good to draw it before you dissect it and start cutting things up because you can't uncut it once you have. Um, so go ahead and do whatever, whatever sort of outside drawing of it you want. I'm gonna keep mine relatively small. You might wanna try to get the overall shape of the fruit before you start drawing the texture or the external patterns, because then you might lose the proportions and the accuracy of the overall shape, which tend to be more important than the patterns anyways. So I'm noticing that it's probably one of these like Fibonacci dealios with the, the way that these um, scale things are going around it. So I'm not gonna try to get super detailed about that, but I'll try to kind of do, at least I did a little bit with pencil before jumping into ink and jumping into these shapes. And now I'm doing the shapes. They look like sort of leaf scars. Little inverted triangle thingy, Mulabis, bumps on the outside. And something looks like where the flowers were down here. Um, all right, so I've got that. That ink probably needs to dry for a second. So I think this is a completely different species than um, uh, completely different species than the other pitaya, the other dragon fruit that's red on the inside, and I think they taste um, completely um, different. I I haven't eaten one of these in a long time, so I'm not totally sure. But I know with the other dragon fruits, there's a, I went to a whole lecture about dragon fruits one time by a uh, dragon fruit specialist. And he was saying that a lot of the ones that are sold are not um, varieties that have been selected for flavor and that there's a huge difference between the varieties. So that's varieties within species, um, sort of like the varieties of lettuce that we were looking at um, before. Um, okay, so this is probably dry. So I'm going to go ahead and get a wash of color because I think the outside color is kind of important on this um, in this case. 
And so it's not Hansa yellow light. It's looking like it's almost straight on um, Hansa yellow medium. So I'm just going to take out um, maybe with a little bit of that um, permanent orange. Or is that new gamboge? Maybe it's closer to new gamboge. But I'll start with the paler yellow first, and I can always add a little bit more um, of the orange afterwards. You could also, if you wanted to, you could just do this in color swatches. Uh, remember, color swatches is always a really quick way to capture color information on your page, um, especially for people who uh, maybe are more intimidated by drawing or um, don't have the time to go into a full drawing. I'm going to take a little bit of the. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of the this. I, I'm now. I'm thinking this new gamboge is probably like the spot on color. Um, I might do a little bit of um, swatches here. And the important thing with swatches is to write down next to them, have like, I have initials for all of my colors. Um, and this is HYM. So very, very quickly, you could capture um, color information by using letters. So if you don't have your watercolor palette, I highly recommend you memorize the abbreviations of all your colors. And then at the very least, you can take quick notes um oh that's cool that you get the, they i think they're expensive here too ray bonto um so that's part of why i'm nature journaling it before i eat it because then i get more uh, out of the experience all right so i'm wondering if i cut a really thin slice i might be able to even uh put it in my plant press i know that the the leafy parts of cactus were probably the worst for the, the early botanist because trying to press like a prickly pear cactus pad in a, a plant press would probably be super annoying. So I'm noticing there's these green bits where I think these are basically leaf scars. They look like leaf scars to me. So leaf scars are often the way that you can tell which part of the plant was up or down, at least on stems. Um, so looking at leaf scars can be really useful. Um, but I'm not totally sure uh, what's going on here. Anyways, we could look really closely at the surface here and uh, nature journal that. We could also do it from different perspectives. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't eaten one of these in a long time, Raybonto, so I'm not totally sure. Um, how they taste. I want to make a note about this end having this sort of deep hole here and having this sort of scar tissue on it. So I'm going to hold it that way so you can see that as well. Um, and then I'm going to try to draw that. Do you see that? Um, and then I'm going to, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make an arrow going to that part. This is all pre dissection, but this could be you know, part of the species profile. A good thing to do on species profile would be to do a map. I was hoping Wikipedia would have a range map, but we might have to just do our own. They, they said the um, countries, modern day countries where it grows, but um, a range map would be really cool. Okay, so I got an arrow coming to this part, um, and now I'm going to draw a square. I don't want to get too caught up in this part um, because I do want to um, dissect it. All right, now I'm going to see can focus on not my best drawing ever but I'm gonna use words to make up for um, the imperfect um, drawing all right see you later Tim um, yes, Eve, I think this is in, would be inferior ovary because the perianth would be coming out from here and it would be, it looks like it's attached to the vegetative part of the plant here. And it looks like they have to use clippers to cut the, um, through the stem here. Um, so I'm going to use some words to describe, um, this sort of woody scar tissue hole on this end of it. And then I'm just gonna write flower connection, question mark. I'm pretty positive that's where the flower connects, but I'm not going to 
necessarily assume that. Okay, time to get into some dissection here. So, um, let's see here. Dun, dun, dun. So I had these X-Acto knives lying around. I'm gonna switch chairs. So let's see, which tool should I use for dissecting this? Um, I wonder, I wonder, I might have to have another cup of tea while I, oh, I also sometimes scissors can be helpful for dissection as well. Vote for which tools you think I should use for dissecting the dragon fruit. This one's really small, but these ones are all very pointy. And then I also really like the um, X-Acto knives that I have wrist issues. Um, oh yeah, maybe I should use a machete. Um, I have wrist issues, so I like these X-Acto knives that have the really big handle. They usually, um, these are all for crafts stuff, you know, for like cutting paper and everything. They usually come with these really thin handles. But I think that the thin handles um, oftentimes make it like really hard on your hand. So I like the ones that come with um, the big handles like this. And they, they you can change the blade. I've been using this one. This is a really large blade, but I mostly have been cutting paper or even cardboard. And so the blade, the large blade makes it helpful. I think what I'm going to actually do is put in a very small blade on this one and then use the large the large knife, the kitchen knife that I have for um, doing other types of, um, you know, bigger cuts. And let's see if I can get this to tighten properly. The other thing is if I, I'm going to need to make sure I clean all this. The X-Acto knife is not made for wet stuff. So as you can see, some of these blades have already rusted. Okay, so I think that's good between the scissors, that and that. I think that covers my bases. And let's see if I can get into a good location. Um, you might not be able to see my journal this whole time, but you will be able to see the fruit. So hopefully your nature journaling and not just watching um, my nature journal page in progress. Um, let's see here. And then I'm also hoping to still have time. I know we're already um, at the hour limit, but I am hoping to still have time to do some dissection of this as well. Chicken wing. Uh, but of, of course I'm gonna do this one first because I don't want raw chicken on this fruit if I'm going to eat the fruit later. Okay, so, oh, the other thing that would be good to have if you were doing anything like this at home would be something to wipe your hands on if you are cutting and touching and then you have to go to your um, you have to go to your nature journal. You don't want to be getting blood and dragon fruit blood on your paper. I don't know how Leonardo da Vinci did that. I'm gonna have to go look back at some of his pages and see. I mean, I can't imagine dissecting a human uh, body and then going and drawing it um, and not getting some mess on your page. But okay, so the first thing I want to do is something maybe really small. Um, and to see if we can learn anything from just the, the skin layer. So what I'm going to try to do is actually remove one of these um, small scales here. So I'm just going to, and maybe what I'll do is as soon as my drawing is dry, I will sort of show my steps on the page. Um, it's not totally dry, but I'm gonna use a paper towel to pad it off. That's always an option. That worked just fine. Whoa, whoa. Worked just fine there. Susan, that is such a great idea, and I'm very impressed by your courage and your curiosity. And part of me was thinking, like, oh, that'd be really cool. But then I was thinking, oh, would, would that be, like, too crazy? Would people get, like, weirded out by that? How many people would do that? I think it's a, a, a very great idea for not only learning about bird anatomy, but also it's a bird that, that we're more connected with 
than any 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 birds that we're looking at when we're birding. So like knowing about it, if you know anything about a, a bird at all, the bird you should know about is chickens. If you if you eat chicken, like most people eat so much chicken um, that it's definitely like something that we should know about and and have some type of you, you know we can use our nature journaling connection um, to learn about it. Well, I need way more paper towels here. I'm noticing juice coming out already. This is getting messy already. Um, so what I said I was going to do, got distracted, is I'm going to draw a square around one of these. I'm calling them leaf scars, but I'm not sure if that's what they are. And then I'm going to show how I cut that off, okay? And what I usually do is a symbol of a, of a knife. Um, let's see if I can draw it coming like this. Even though I'm not using this type of knife um, with like a hand on it. It's good to have a visual vocabulary like this and um, some symbols that you can use. So I know that's not great, but, um, oh gosh, that's so hard with the camera. So you can see there, I drew this knife and I'm gonna show that this basically is the dissected part over here. Um, this is really hard with the, um, getting the exposure right because this camera doesn't automatically do that. So I'm just going to cut a square and I'm going to try to just remove the skin part. I think I, I will be able to just remove the skin part. I think on this one I, I went in too deep and that's where that juice started to come out. So it's unevenly um, tough. Noticing some parts are way harder to cut through than other parts. Okay, now there's that other tool that I wish I had that's sort of like a spatula that I could put underneath here and lift up. Oh, here we go, here we go. Oh yeah, I'm so glad I cut it this way. Okay, look at that. Very interesting. So one possibility would be to sort of draw it in this sort of cut away version where this part is lifting or like a trap door perspective. Um, I'm sure Mark Simmons would capture that really quickly. And look at that glistening white um, sort of styrofoam texture on the inside is very interesting. Um, I'm going to measure the thickness of the skin, not where the, um, the this sort of leaf scar bump thing is. Oh, you know what? I was reading that these ones have thorns on them. So it's possible that these had um, thorns that were removed from the fruit by hand. Okay, so I'm going to measure the thickness of the yellow part. Uh, maybe I should draw it first. So many things here. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show it at its side. So basically, I'm going to draw this from the side. So this would be a cross section. So here you can see the um, sort of cross section of the piece of skin that I'm drawing. Maybe I should bring the camera closer again. I wish I had a way to zoom in with this camera besides moving the whole table. All right, so. Um, now I'm going to measure it. It looks like the white part and the yellow part are almost the same um, thickness. Just about two millimeters for each. Um, in the thin parts, the yellow is two millimeters and the white is two millimeters.
it is thicker where the um, this leaf scar thing is. Okay, now I'm going to take this out completely. And then what I'm going to do is I want to do a cross section of the part that has this bump on it. Whoa, that didn't even want to get cut through us, so I kind of squished it. Maybe that was either the material was too tough. This would be really cool to look at under a microscope, but this is the cross section of the um, part where this these either these spines or the leaf scar. So look how much thicker it is in that part. It's very tough. Some of the skin is very tough. So look at the cross section of that part, very different. So I'm gonna hold that right here and then um, try to draw it. Actually, I'm gonna, uh, how was my orientation on the other one? Okay, I need to draw this piece then. Now look at the cross section, at least the general shape of that would be good to capture. and I will measure it. The white part got squished while I was cutting it, so I'm not gonna try to measure that part because I think it will be um, inaccurate. Oh, and this is over five millimeters. This is at, this looks like six, seven, 7.5 millimeters thick at the part where these little bumps are. So that's the outer skin. Just the yellow part is seven millimeters. Okay, so I got that skin. Now I'm gonna go, and I think the, you know, zooming out a little bit and cutting up some of the bigger parts of it is gonna be easier for everybody else to Nature Journal. So I'm gonna cut into the rest of it now that I've cut this section out. And remember, one, one tip when you're watching these live videos is you can control the speed of the video. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can go to the bottom corner there where you see something that looks like a gear wheel. And if you click on that gear wheel, you can control the speed of the video and you can actually slow it down or speed it up. If the video is going too fast and you want more time to draw the individual parts, um, you can slow it down. Ooh, part of me wants to draw on the outside skin with a Sharpie to sort of see like make the, the the pattern of these uh, more more clear. That could be a fun thing to do. I'm gonna just do that really quickly. Oh, not a gel pen, Sharpie. I'm not gonna eat the skin, so I think it's fine. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This would definitely count as playing with your food, so don't tell your mom. Don't tell my mom. Good thing she doesn't know about the Sunday live shows. She only knows about the Wednesday shows. Oh, yeah, this is so fun. Okay, I wonder where this one, this one has to curve up to there. That's interesting. Oh, my gosh, this is so cool. I want to draw on more fruit. Oh, look, that one, go, is that one supposed to go all the way to there? That looks right. Oh shoot, actually, oh no, I messed up. That one's supposed to go to up there. Dude, I can't erase. Dang it, this one is supposed to go to up there. This one's supposed to go to up here. Okay, next one. I don't know, that one's probably supposed to go to up here then. It's like connect the dots on a fruit. Oh no, that one probably is supposed to go to up there. Whatever. Anyways, and now I'm going to come back and I'm going to do these ones going the other way. Um, so there's, you could draw the lines this way too.
This would be really good drawing practice to draw these lines on it first and then to try to draw it afterwards because then you can see the three-dimensionality of it so much better. Except for the part where I messed up. Oh man, this is so fun. I'm just going to go to the store. So pro tip, you can go to the store and draw on them without buying them and, and just nature journal them at the store. Um, and, and you can save some money that way. Oh my gosh, this is like the funnest thing that I've done in so long. Like the, the funnest thing, except for like that insect drawing, um, class that that one lady's doing on YouTube. I can't tell how these ones are supposed to connect. It gets a little confusing down here, but that was like, I mean, now you can see the three dimensionality to it. Um, I feel like so much better and I have Sharpie on my fingers, but anyways, now, um, oh, I ran out of tea. Oh wait, no, I still have some more. I love this thermos. It keeps my tea really hot so I can just drink it out of this like dainty little cup and like point my pinky finger up and whoa look I have sharpie on my pinky finger oh it is like a fishnet Raybonta that's a really good point that that diamond sort of fishnet pattern is um there's something about that that's sort of a universal pattern very interesting comparison very very interesting some fruit come in a a, a net a netting of material that is also in that diamond pattern. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut into it, but there's several major decisions. These lines all follow sort of this um, external topography, um, external patterning, and morphology, but what we're actually um, have to ask ourselves is um, do we want to cut it this way or do we want to cut it this way? Um, and I think, um, you know, depending on what you're dissecting, like for example, on an onion, a lot of times it's more interesting to cut it this way um, than to cut it this way. And one is like an architecture, one would be a plan and one would be a, uh, I forget, I always forget what the other one is called. One is a plan and one is a, shoot, I don't remember. But on this, I'm going to see if I can do, get away with both. So um, post in the comments. Um, Yes, nature sketches. I think you're right. I think there is a Fibonacci thing going on here, similar to pine cones. Um, it, it, it seems similar to pine cones in a lot of ways. I lost the um, pattern up here, but I think it will. These will probably are probably all spiraling um, into the center if you look at them from the top. Um, I messed that one up, so it kind of throws it off. Okay, so um, I have the option to cut it this way or cut it this way, write in the comments which way you think will give us the most useful information. If you haven't done this exercise already, this is in John Muir Law's book, um, the How to Teach Nature Journaling, and he talks about like, here, you can cut it this way, and this is like when they do it in architecture or engineering. This applies to a lot of other things besides nature, um, even though everything is basically nature. Like, is that more interesting, or, or can we learn more, display more that way, or this way? Look at how how different it is depending on um, which way way you cut it. So what do you think about the dragon fruit? Um, which way should we cut it? Like this or like that? And I'm trying to remember, one is, this is cross section and this is plan. I can't remember, there's, there's names in um, architecture for, okay, so Aneta answered first, um, or maybe that was one of the kids, I'm not sure. Um, and I will go with that way. Okay, Eve is also going with the uh, the long way. Um, some people call it like a hot dog or hamburger. Um, I think when they're folding paper. Gene, is there a pit inside? Good question. We're about to find out. Write those questions down. Okay, so now I, I would draw, if you have the time, like ideally this session will be best for people who are watching besides me. Um, in terms of in terms of your your drawing, because you'll have more time to 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 draw and and be taking notes even of some of the things I say. But for example, you saw how I showed the knife cutting off that segment, um, and then coming over here. I should probably put that inside of a, a bounding box here. Um, that was the skin segment. 
now you could draw a knife or somehow you could use words saying that it's be being cut in half. Um, so for example, you could just draw a simple cartoon of the fruit and then um, a dotted line. Oftentimes, I should have done this with black. Um, that is the fruit and then like a dotted line. Or you could draw a hand with a knife coming down, however you want to do it. So I'm going to, I'm foreseeing I won't be able to cut through this stem part here. So I'm going to off center my cut a little bit and I'm going to try to cut through this window. Um, I think I want to cut through that window. Yes, I want to cut through that window and avoid that. So this is something I think surgeons actually do before they cut people open um, to do surgery is they write on them with um, markers. When I had surgery on my wrist, I'm pretty sure there was like, marks on it where they had cut. So um, just to make this easier and to help me not, oh, I should do a different color though. Dang it. Let me get a different color. I wonder if, I wonder if um, gel pins will work on a dragon fruit. Oh, they do. Cool. Okay. So I'm going to draw this purple line going up here where I'm going to cut it. I really want to avoid this because it's really tough. Um, come down here. I think I can cut through this bottom part. I really want to see what the cross section of that part looks like, oh, maybe I should have had a saw, a serrated blade um, to cut through some of these tough parts. I didn't think about that. Whoa, that's not a very straight line, Marley. Come on. And drawing on our food, drawing on our food. It's my new, new favorite, favorite thing to do. Drawing on my food, I'm drawing on my food. All right. Remember, kids and adults, you probably don't want to eat these art supplies. So if this were something where you're going to eat the surface of, uh, do not draw on it first or use um, food color. Okay, so let's see. Here we go. I think this knife is pretty sharp. I wish I had some like special music to play right now. I'm so glad I cut through. Whoa, there's red on the inside. There's some red, little red wiggly things. Well, they're not wiggly, but like as in moving, but I'm really glad I cut through the window because it looks really interesting where the window is. Oh, there's little drips of juice coming out. Um, all right, so right now, let's just take a few minutes to do your own nature journaling technique. You can use, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of. Um, or, or whatever you want. I'm going to lay one. Should I lay one like that? No, maybe not. I'll lay them both like this and bring the camera closer. Um, but right now, for the next five minutes, do whatever nature journaling strategy you want. You could use, I notice, I wonder, it reminds me of with words. You could focus on trying to get the most um, precise sketch. Um, anything like that. No central pithy structure that I can see, no. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, so follow whatever nature journaling strategy you want for, for the next five minutes, because um, I want to <laughs> focus on drawing this a little bit myself, and if I'm talking a lot, then that's hard. You might not be able to see my drawing because I've focused in on the fruit, um, if you do, I notice I wonder it reminds me of, make sure you write lots of questions. If you're just drawing it, uh, make sure you write lots of questions too, because hopefully you have some, some good ones. And I'm going to make an arrow coming away from it. This part is really interesting. Very interesting fruit. Since there is some amount of symmetry to it, you might not need to draw both sides.
Whoops. Dang it. If you are just focused on drawing, remember you can still use words to um, fill in gaps in your drawing or things that didn't come out quite right or colors that you don't have, things like that. In case you want to include it in your drawing, um, the thickness that I was finding when I first cut that piece of skin off was about two millimeters, and um, in the in in sort of the average parts, some of the thicker parts are up to dang, that's almost ten millimeters in some of the thickest parts. I can remove seeds in a moment. Is there a pattern to how the seeds are dispersed inside? I'm not getting too much of a smell. I'm getting sort of a vegetal smell, if anything. It reminds me of the smell of freshly cut aloe vera um, or a freshly cut prickly pear cactus, just the, the vegetative part, the pads. I'm not getting in much of a floral or, or fruity or sweet. Aromatic smells, I'm not getting any of that. Um, this would be a good opportunity to do some estimating. Um, just This is really good if, if you're with a group of people as a competition. It can be a really fun game um, is to everybody write down a number without sharing your numbers out loud because that will throw off people's estimates. Um, everybody write down a number of how many they think are here. And then afterwards, as a group, count them exactly. Um, you could take a screenshot or, or rewind the video and count them exactly and see who was closest. Um, that can be a really fun game to do with a group of kids. I've done it before with like lentils and you throw the lentils onto a sheet and everybody has like a minute to come up with an estimate maybe. And then you um, actually count them and see who was closest. And you could even have like a prize. It's really fun to do that. And after you do it like 10 times, you get a lot better. And then you challenge your, your parents or, or someone else and see um, how well they do. And what you'll realize is that you will probably destroy them in the competition. And that's a really useful for certain, for certain tasks and for certain nature journaling things, being able to estimate numbers of things like that is actually really, really useful. Jack has a thing in the back of his book. And I think, um, in his journals, there's like a printout version of it that helps with that and shows like, what does a thousand look like? What does a hundred look like? And there's these little dots in those quantities. Now there's not, I'm not seeing much of a regular pattern compared to something like a, um, the inside of like a seeds on like an, a, a tomato, for example, things are just sort of random, almost randomly looking dispersed throughout. So that's an interesting thing to note or to try to show in your drawing. Bye, Vea. Hope you feel better. I don't know if I'm going to get around to the chicken wing. We're already at like an hour and a half. Okay, so there's not very many seeds like right next to the edges. There seems to be sort of a space there, especially in here near the bottom. I'm noticing that mostly or near this part where I think this is the part where the flower came out. Um, there's more distance between the seeds and this part out there. Um, I'm not using color right now. Um, I'm not using color right now, but I do want to make a note that there is this red color in there. Um, Susan has a really good question. 
I will take some seeds out next. It looks like some of them got cut by the knife, maybe. But it does look like most of them are the same size, but in some places they are clumped together, yes. So it looks like they're big. there could be a big seed in some places, but it's several seeds clumped together. Great, great question, Susan. Um, I will take out a seed now and, and try to measure it. One thing I never measure is weight because I don't have a good thing for measuring weight, but that could be a, a really interesting nature journaling measurement to have. Um, so there's a slimy coating. It, it's, it's sort of an irregular shape unless this is too stuck together. Wow, that's a weird shape. It's an irregular kind of asymmetrical shape here. Um, I'll hold that up there um, before I put it back down uh, next to the measuring stick. Never make an assumption based on one thing though. So like one seed or one animal or one plant, one leaf, it's not enough information. So always check multiple, but it looks like this one's kind of similar too. They don't look completely symmetrical. They have a pointier end and they have this sort of coating of slimy. This one's way more asymmetrical than the rest though. And I'm not gonna measure that one because it seems like an anomaly. Don't measure the anomaly for your, or, or don't make assumptions based on the anomaly about the rest. One, two, three, four four millimeters long and about two millimeters wide. Four millimeters long for the seed and two millimeters wide. It's almost like a watermelon seed type shape. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple more cuts and then I'm gonna to have to start eating it. I don't think we're gonna get around to doing the chicken wing today. I'll have to do that for a different show. So those are the seeds. Um, they seem very hard. They are covered in a, in, a, in a coating. They're pointier on one end, sort of like a watermelon seed. And it does seem like there's some variation in size and shape. Um, they're sticky. Mm, they're not that hard. They crunch in my mouth. Okay, now I'm going to do this, this cut because sometimes you can see interesting information from this side as well. That maybe there's a pattern from this side that we didn't see from the other side. Still not very much pattern um, in terms of how the seeds are spread out. It seems like they're randomly spread out. I wonder if I should put this in my plant press. It might be a little bit weird. Maybe if I do like a really thin, thin slice, but it's, it's probably going to be kind of messy. So if you want to, I'm going to hold this this way so you can um, draw this perspective on it. I think the, the fact that there's not really much pattern in, in the way the seeds are dispersed is really useful information, personally. Because like a passion fruit or, you know, a lot of fruit, if you cut them open, there is a pattern to how the seeds are spread out. An apple, an apple seed, the, they're like in the star type pattern. I would be uh, writing a lot of questions about that part. Oh, I forgot to write that there are red, red spots in the middle. Red, red lines in the middle. Still not very much smell, like it's still that sort of a vegetal smell, so almost just the smell of like crushed up leaves, uh, crushed up uh, cactus pads. 
and there's these little white lines. I don't know if you can see that through the reflection, but there's these um, point in. Oh, that is a really good observation, Susan. Thank you for sharing that. I had not even. And see, that's an observation that we can notice from this cut that we couldn't notice. Um, okay, so these would have been this way. These would have been this way. We cut them this way. And Susan is asking, are most of the pointy ends pointing towards the center? I can't tell for sure. Some of the seeds have moved because when the knife went through, it moved them around. But it kind of does look like, oh wait, there's one that's not pointing towards the center. It does look like a lot of them are pointing towards the center, but I'm not totally sure. Susan, that is a, a wonderful, I love that observation slash question. And I love how um, you asked it as a question, because sometimes we might jump to a conclusion observation and it, it might not be true, like if we actually start counting them. That one's definitely pointing outwards, but that is possible that that one got flipped around when I cut through. So the next time I cut through, what I would do is I would pay attention to see if um, the direction that I was cutting, because I'm not sure if I was cutting this way. I probably was cutting that way. So that one does look like it would have been flipped over. It could have easily flipped over. Hmm, very interesting. So I'm not totally sure, but it's possible that, oh, that one's not pointing towards the center. It, it is possible. That's a very, very interesting question requiring further research. But the next thing I'm going to do is just take a slice of it and, um, oh, Cindy, that is a good, okay, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that right now. And that's going to be the last thing I do before I eat it is I'm going to try pressing it with wax paper in my plant press. So let me put the table down a little bit. I know a good idea when I hear one. And I'm willing to try that. Let's see if we can get this set up here so you can all see this fun and potentially very messy project. So I got this, these new clamps on my press that work way better than the screws that came with it originally um, because um, those screws would have taken me 15 minutes just to open the press. Um, they limit all of these, they have all these other negative side effects. This is going to be even moister than what was the last one? The salad. Okay, so I got salad there. And now I'm going to get some wax paper. Where's the wax paper? Luckily, I have wax paper ready to go. The problem about wax paper and plant press is it doesn't let that much air through. So I think I'll just do wax paper on one side and um, where's my extra paper in here? I think I have extra paper that's ready to go in here somewhere. And maybe an extra piece of cardboard, please. Yes. Haha. <laughs> What's this? Ooh, yes. Here we go. I'm going to use this. Oops. Oh, okay. It's gone. All right, I'm gonna use this, which is some like pretty heavy duty paper on one end. And I'm gonna take, was that the piece of cardboard I'm gonna take? I'm gonna take this piece of cardboard. What's this? Oh, there's still something in there. So I'm gonna leave that. All right, so I'm gonna put wax paper on one side and then I'm gonna put regular paper on the other side. And this is, um, uh, this is going to be, this is sort of like watercolor paper. Oh, Debbie's here. Um, this is watercolor paper and I'm gonna squish that on because I want I, I want it to stick, like mounted onto one of these. Um, and I'm gonna use the, the watercolor type paper for that. And then I'll put cardboard on the other side so there's good airflow. Cause that can be the problem with the wax paper. Now the question is which, ideally I would wanna do this long cut but I think that could be challenging unless I do it further out to the side here. Uh, maybe I'll try that. I'll try a couple cuts this way. 
it's quite tough, especially where these sort of leaf scars are. Wow, that is a really interesting shape. Look at that. Very cool. Kind of wish I didn't have all the Sharpie marks on it now. This is cool. Oh, that's really cool right there. There's Sharpie markers all over it, but. All right, I think this is the piece that I've been looking for right here. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Now, if this works, it will be super cool. And I'll try one from that other perspective as well. Jeez, by the end of this, there's not gonna be very much left for me to, to taste. Oh man, those parts of the skin are really hard to cut through. Hopefully that's thin enough and doesn't just create a huge mess in my flower press. But I like it, we're gonna try it. We're gonna flow with it and put the paper down on top of that and then just squish it like a pancake. Oh, another piece of cardboard. So there's good air, wait, is there cardboard on the other side of it? Uh, oh shoot, I should've put cardboard on both sides of it. Oh man, it's right next to the salad piece. I need cardboard in between it and the salad. Okay, if this works, the next thing I'm gonna try is how to squish bugs in here. Okay, now another piece of cardboard for good airflow because I don't want this to mold. I'm gonna put this in my car or next to my stove or something, somewhere where it can dry very, very well. And then rest of the paper on the top. And time to squish it down. Oh yeah, there's juice coming out of it. No, just kidding. Not yet, at least. And then get my clamps ready to go. I'm so, so addicted to pressing flowers and plants right now. It's like everything, I wanna put everything in this and then glue them into my nature journal with Mod Podge afterwards. All right, let's see, we're gonna find out. Thank you for that idea, um, Cindy, that was a really cool idea. Now the last part of nature journaling food for today because we didn't get around to nature journaling the chicken wing is I'm gonna taste this and provide some gustatory data which we usually don't get in our nature journaling because we're usually not tasting anything in our nature journal. Okay, bye Charlotte, have a good one. See you later. Um, so I'm gonna switch cameras and do this last thing. Let y'all know how it tastes and you can write information down from that even though it'll be secondhand information and then that will be it for the day. I think I still have a little bit of room on my, that's a pretty good page have a little bit of room on my page down here to write about the taste. Um, I like the way the collection looks up here, even though there's no color and it's just salad. Um, it's kind of cool that you can actually, you know, make a good nature journal page from, from food that's in your house. Um, even without the exotic dragon fruit, um, you know, I've got the onion over here too. Okay, so let's try this, tasting this real quick. Um, I don't even know where to start now with tasting it. Um, I guess I could just bite into this one here, but it might be messy. Mmm, it, it's a little bit slimy, not very much flavor at first, but then a lot of sweetness, not very much acid, but not very much sourness, but sort of like a kiwi flavor with crunchy seeds. Very juicy, very sweet. Um, you 
Yeah, it reminds me quite a bit of a, a kiwi, a lot sweeter than I was expecting. Not much acidity to balance the sweetness. So um, if you're going to write down that tasting information in your nature journal, um, from an epistemological perspective, it's really important to put it down as secondhand information. So sometimes when someone else tells you something in nature, like that's a red-tailed hawk, you might want to write down that Uncle Tom or Uncle George said it was a uh, red-tailed hawk, as opposed to just taking that as gospel and writing it down that um, it's a red-tailed hawk. Or in this case, especially since you're not actually tasting this, um, to write down that Marley said it was very sweet, juicy, crunchy seeds, and um, low acid. Very sweet. Uh, like similar to kiwi you could probably do I notice I wonder it reminds me of just with tasting things the seeds are getting stuck in my teeth sort of slimy you could also use quotation marks or make like a little cartoon drawing of me and have those um, descriptions coming out that would be another way to epistemologically distinguish between your direct observation versus an observation that is being mediated by another person. Very sweet, similar to kiwi, sort of slimy. Um, low acid, or, or almost no acid. Crunchy seeds. So this leads me to the question, I wonder how the seeds survive being eaten by animals, or I wonder what animal disperses these in nature. I wonder if these seeds are dispersed by animals in nature. If they're not dispersed by animals in nature, how are they dispersed? Those would be some questions. So you can see my page here, just nature journaling food. Um, you can go to the grocery store next time. And this could actually be good for your diet as well because eating different types of weird food, fruits, <laughs> eating different types of weird fruit and vegetables could be like an interesting dietary thing and just getting more diversity in your diet, but it can also lead to nature journaling. So next time you go to the grocery store, think about it from a nature journaling perspective. And you could probably, if you're brave, you could probably just nature journal in the grocery store without actually buying that stuff if, if you don't necessarily want to buy it. Definitely some food is more fun to nature journal than others, but if you're really... Um, inquisitive and curious and use the techniques of nature journaling, you could probably even make some type of food like this into a nature journaling project. Thanks everyone for joining in today. Oh, I see James Coleman has a cool comment about sassafras. Um, that would be a really fun thing to nature journal and maybe even nature journaling the process of making root beer um, would be really cool. Thanks to everyone for joining in today. And thanks especially to people who support me on Patreon. That's how this show is made possible. I am basically full-time doing this show, full-time teaching nature journaling and the people supporting the show on Patreon, um, make it possible. I really need all of your help right now, especially, um, I haven't been able to get out and teach nature journaling in the field very much because of my fractured patella. Um, so I'm doing my best and making as many fun shows as possible. Main thing is to inspire and empower you to do your own nature journaling. So I hope you nature journaled along during the show. And I hope this inspires you, if not to get out in nature journal right now, then to get out in nature journal tomorrow. All right, everybody. Bye, Ray Bonto. Bye, Anetta and family. Bye, James. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Charlotte. Bye, Nature Sketches. Oh, I already said Nature Sketches. Bye, Debbie, Cindy. I think Ivea left already. Susan, Jean. Bye, everybody. Um, have a great day. Bye.